So, Berto, we did an episode a little bit ago on QAnon, and I asked for follow-up questions, so let's read those. And if we have time, we'll go to some emails as well. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology Installed Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Casagna, and I build one-legged tables. People, so this is someone uh, emailing in, people seem to get into QAnon and trust it over members of their own family their close friends, etc. What qualities of a QAnon? What qualities of QAnon lead people to trust memes instead of the real people in their lives, Berto? Yeah, that's interesting. But I don't know that it's. You know, I think I think this could have happened with different. Um, it, it didn't have to be this specific of a of a cult or of a belief system. But there are some things about it, like universally, it you know people are like, hey harming kids is bad yeah like we shouldn't be abusing kids so that already is something that's hard to argue against even remember when they were interviewing the president and and it's like uh they think that you're trying to save children from being abducted and killed and then and then he's like well is that supposed to be a bad thing (laughs) right like it's already like oh yeah that's a good cause that's one thing and then the other thing is we all grew up with movies and books and everything about uh, secrets and government spies and, and all these things and there's a level of James Bond intrigue to this thing you know you have these super secret high level clearance agents disclosing information and you can be part of so there's a the same thing that makes people like video games and like mystery shows and all these things that I think appeals uh, and and lastly it's a community that is large and so you feel like you're part of a community so then why you would trust that above your your family member i think people trust a lot of things over their family members you know there yeah. there's all sorts of things that they're into that their family members don't don't approve of <laughs> right yeah so and i could see you know email or why it would look like that like why would you just believe a meme over me i you know i'm you know, there's me and there's memes. So, you know, why are you believing memes over me? It's way more than that. The people who were into QAnon fully were, uh, it wasn't just memes, you know, it was articles and discussions and support among people. And as you say, Birdo, building off centuries of ideas that are totally infused in our culture about good versus evil and, yeah. and demons and stuff. Um, other factors that we listed in the last episode were fear, QAnon uh, infused, you know, 100% fear all yeah. the time. Uh, social media obviously is a big factor. It, ex- you know, uh, 30 years ago, if you wanted to know anything about a conspiracy theory, you'd have to go to the library. Most people didn't go to the library. Right. <laughs> and, and now and, you just open your phone. Right. So that's another thing. <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, in addition to the fear, there is an answer don't worry there is a plan right i will create something for you to be afraid of that doesn't exist and create an answer that also doesn't exist and you can only get the answer from here right something to do because everyone's bored and there's a lot more prevalence than the pandemic and i i think we underappreciate how bored and stuck in the house we all were (laughs) in april of two of 2020 right um what I labeled as Christian energy, meaning that there are Christians and other religions for that matter in Western society that have a lot of dogma around demons and yep. devils are right around the corner. You know, sermons, you could go to sermons because that's the main mm-hmm. kind of I- ideological push of any kind of congregation meeting at, at church on Sunday. Yeah. You could have a minister that talks about demons and devils every week for like five years. Yeah, that, yeah. that could just, you know, the devil is around the corner. Your your uncle who is an atheist has been, uh, you know, tempted by the devil. You know, just devil, 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 demon, 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 angel, 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 you know. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, conspiracy theory tapped into that energy. And this didn't come out of a vacuum. Like, it wasn't like... We had no inputs into the system until two years ago. We have decades of radio shows and then internet shows uh, doing preambles to all of this, right? Right. Saying 
it's all a conspiracy. Don't trust the government. You can't yeah. do this. The powers that be are doing this. The powers that be are doing that. I, I infiltrated such, you know, like these things have been around. Yeah. And so now it, it's a lot of those same people that follow those things are ripe for the next thing. Right. Also, you have distrust building in our society. You could blame that partially on some political figures or just, I don't know, distrust building. You also have the need for community. People have a need for an in-group we yep. want. And to uh, be in the in-group of QAnon, you had to believe certain things. But if you believe in certain things, you know, the thing that I learned when I was treating a lot of teenagers was there were two groups that I found this to be true of, gang members and also like the bad kids of a school. Okay. And the phenomenon was the same, was that if you are in a group and you feel alienated and alone and isolated, one of the fastest routes to group acceptance is gangs or the bad kids gangs or the bad kids yeah because to me and i'll I'll stay away from gangs is you know it's kind of not as common but the bad kids all you got to do is smoke a cigarette behind the gym ah sure all you got to do is tag the toilet in the bathroom all you got to do is tell the history teacher to fuck off and you get detention and you're you're one of the bad kids there's a low barrier to entry right so and all you got to do is to stay in the group is to be a bad kid. Yeah. Smoke cigarettes, smoke pot, get kicked out, get suspended, not don't do your homework. And I found a lot of kids who were, you know, uh, doing well in school prior, but they were isolated, they were alone, they were looking for a group and they found the bad kids. Mm. And suddenly their entire world and all their motivation, you know, flipped on its head. Yeah. So um when QAnon comes along and you're isolated, you don't know what to do. All you got to do is believe in these things and right. say these things. And we will, because the other people in the group are also alone and isolated. And they're also desperate for indications of loyalty. Right. So th- that's a really great point. You don't have to go through some elaborate initiation, proof of income, proof of nothing. You just simply have to say, I believe. Right. Think about how you and I and our group of friends are friends. Yeah. We had to slowly, over years and years, invite you to things, right. show up to things, laugh at jokes that aren't funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make up a fake personality that makes pun jokes that are is not a real person. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's tough work. Yeah. And if you don't have... If you don't have the luxury of time or you're insecure. Pretend to want to do a podcast for 13 years. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, because I'm in the Dungeons and Dragons world and there's yeah. a lot of socially challenged people in that group. Not, oh, all, yeah, sure. not always, but particularly in the past. And the entry into the group is Dungeons and Dragons. Right. There's a rule set. You study that thing and you can enter the group. And, and now you have a group of dudes you can play uh, every right. week with and, and there's and, instructions if you can follow these instructions you're in right um, the problem was for someone that's not socially challenged <laughs> and I'll just <laughs> never forget I, these guys we would played together uh, for I don't know months and I walk in and I'm like jazz to play I'm like hey. <laughs> and no one even looked up from their books to acknowledge I had walked into the room oh, no <laughs> not because they hated me because they're just they're just they don't have, uh, I don't know what, yeah, yeah. whatever it is, the to just look up and go, hey, yeah, hey, Kirk, you know, and, you know, just acknowledge that I walked in. I just remember yeah. thinking, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I do this for socializing and gaming, but uh, anyway, so that's another reason. Another reason is that it's fun. There were, you know, a lot of fun elements to the QAnon. Uh, mystery game yeah there are cult elements um obviously mental illness those who are suffering from paranoid schizophrenia or other kinds of things are more susceptible to these fantastical ideas trauma meaning that you can uh one trauma is makes you more susceptible to conspiracy theories but also makes you more likely to see authority as a threat and any kind of idea around that helps um 
There's evolutionary psychology ideas. There's personality cognitive quirks. But anyway, next person wrote in Gita, who I think has been with us a long time, says, when Trump was elected to president in 2016, I remember a spokesperson started to talk about alternative facts. Trump himself wants to rewrite history from time to time. Words matter, and I don't think it is coincidence that conspiracy theories rise in a time when truth is questioned from the leadership of a country. Has there been any studies about educational levels among those who believe in conspiracy theories? Berto, what do you think? I don't know if there's been studies. I, I do know that, um, let's say, anecdotally, I know that some of the people in my life that uh, subscribe to some of these and other conspiracy theories uh, happened to not have a, a higher level education. They didn't go to college, but that's just my little circle of you know, very small sample set. I have no idea in broader terms. I will say that it's probably true for things like um, Flat Earth and a few other things that if you don't actually have an education in those fields, it might be easier for you to misunderstand the science and things like that. Yeah. So that and if you, like me, are a scientist and have worked alongside scientists, yeah. then scientists are demystified and yeah. humanized and generally trusted because the scientists that I've worked with are desperate for um, doing ethical, honorable work. Right. You know, the idea that they would, one, fudge numbers, and two, be seen as someone who is biased as a researcher is, you know, one of the worst things you could, but I, I hang out with a particular brand of non-colonializing, non-sexist, non, <laughs> non privilege you know, they yeah. the researchers that I work with read like half of the readings that they read are like how not to be biased as a researcher based on your culture. Yeah. <laughs> not every culture, not every scientific pocket is like that. But anyway, my point is, is that, um, Education is associated with critical thinking, but yeah. it is not a guarantee. You can have five doctorates and still believe in some wackadoo things. And you know, we take so many things for granted. I think it's a human thing to do, but nowadays we are allowed the biggest benefit of taking things for granted. Because think think about, you know, people are like, oh, you know, uh, the, something about evolution, right? Like evolution doesn't exist or whatever. Okay. We have people in history who devoted decades in some remote, far location, painstakingly drawing creatures and writing down little notes about them and then comparing one to the other, and like a life work. And then, you know, you have scientists today, like that's their, they went to school for it, they spend day after day. Most of the things they try never succeed. That's what they... But we have the luxury of sitting here and going like, the internet doesn't exist, and you're posting it on the internet, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's because we, most of us, I, I include myself, like I don't know what, what, like I've been thinking about this. I installed this game called Farm Simulator. And- On your phone? On my PC, it's like a big ass game where you actually like have to drive the tractors into all the Right, things. right, right. Yeah, yeah, those, those strategies, those kinds of games are, um, appealing to me i've i've there's like prison simulator right. and there's like city simulators and well i have been realizing through playing this how little i understand about how farming works and i'm like well you don't really need these huge machines yeah that's you? one of the fun things about these what did i play recently oh a civil war simulation oh wow where it's really micro. Okay. Every colonel has a name right. and associated with history. And when you muster troops, it takes months just to gather the troops. You, you have to feed them. Right. There's like supply chains. And then in battle, there's morale and ammunition and tiredness. You know, it gets real specific. And I learned so much yeah. about the Civil War right. through this game. <laughs> So, so you rewind the clock, you know, a couple months before I installed this game and we're having one of these discussions and something about farms comes up and I'm going to rattle off a whole bunch of things as if I know what the hell I'm talking about. Now, because I've played the game for just a little bit, now I think I know something about farms, but right. I guarantee you I know still right. nothing about farms. Yeah, Dunning-Kruger. So people, 
And research just does show that people that don't know much about politics are more susceptible to QAnon beliefs yeah. because if you know, and I've seen this so many times, and I've seen it myself. Um, I mean, I don't have a specific example, but I remember at like 19 years of age having extreme opinions about politics, and I guarantee you, <laughs> Um, and the the more I've learned about politics, uh, as you know, what even what do we mean by that? But you know, politics is a broad subject. The more I've learned over the past thirty years, uh, you'll often hear me say, "I know enough to know that I don't know." Because uh, when I talk to actual experts in politics, like not internet people or even journalists, I'm talking like people that are on the inside, like. Um, I talked about Wyatt, who died in Afghanistan, and he made himself, because he, he went to Afghanistan and Iraq several times and was a smart dude and educated himself and was on the ground actually doing the, the war things and yeah. the training of the, the Afghani uh, troops there, the army, and knew about George Bush and knew about the motivations and about you know, what the generals are after and the history of these kinds of things like Vietnam. He knew about all that stuff. And when I would talk to, and I had my ideas like, you know, the, 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 the typical sort of lay person yeah. notion. And he would, and he would, I don't even remember what he told me, but I just remember just fascinated with all the things he would tell me, <laughs> you know, to the point where whenever I went out with him, I, I would just, I would just listen to him, not only about yeah. politics, because he knew so much more about, and it was completely divorced from Republican or Democrat. Sure. He's like, this has nothing to do with Republicans. It has nothing to do with Democrats. This has to do with America and its interests. And Democrats and Republicans are both stupid and smart about this. And yeah. here, let me tell you, like, and he would lay it all out. And not only that, but I would also listen to him tell me about uh, battles that he would have, yeah. uh, and and the the thing because we've seen movies about battles, but the battles that he had, it just sounded um, like nothing I'd seen in a movie. Is, right. is the point, and so um, yeah, Dunning Kruger, it's now, a real thing. What's funny is I I believe that the Dunning Kruger effect has been extremely useful to human civilization because you kind of imagine if you didn't have young humans who believed they had a good idea, <laughs> then we wouldn't have progress, right? Yeah. But, but the difference is, it used to be, you just roll all those dice, most of those dice don't go anywhere. But now we have these tools that accidentally make it so that anyone can roll one of these dice, and other people go, oh yeah, I like that roll, right. let's go with that. Right, like if you are training to become an ironsmith, and you're like, I can do it, it gives you a little bit of confidence to right to quote unquote forge ahead if you will yeah. but uh when we're talking about geopolitical historical cultural <laughs> phenomena that no one understands because they're they involve you know systems and upon systems upon systems and people are uh voting thereof and we have politicians that equally don't know what's happening and making decisions uh yeah that's pretty rough like i i believe you know, we've been using all this copper. I believe we can mix the copper with something else. You're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm going to try it. And then you try to mix it with gold. It doesn't work. The other idiot, I believe we can do it. It doesn't work. Finally, someone does it, and it turns into bronze. You know what you know what you add to copper to make bronze? Because you've played Valheim. I have. Um, and you add zinc, right? Nope. No, you add uh, t uh, tin. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, tin. Oh, tin, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. But, but anyways, but the point is... Berto and I played a video game where there was a lot of mining of <laughs> copper and tin. And tin, right, right. But, but the point is that you need those crazy ideas, and most of them don't work. But now, you can post online, I believe if you mix copper and gold, it turns into something wonderful. And a whole bunch of people are going to go, that's a wonderful idea, I believe it too. Yeah. Next person. I have this hypothesis of humor being one of the major elements that attract new QAnon members. Humor. I think some people might initially find this community stupid and funny, but the more they read about QAnon for entertainment purposes, the more they feel familiar with the community and the beliefs they have. They might eventually become one of them. What are your thoughts on this, Bruno? Uh, that, one's, I, that one I find a little harder to understand because... Oh, really? I thought you would agree because 
when you were talking about 4chan and 8chan, you were saying that 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 was the culture of like you play along in a humorous way. Yes. But you can't see someone transitioning from that to a believer. No, no, I see what you're saying there. I guess what I was thinking was, um, yeah, I guess maybe it's A, knowing what I know now about how dangerous this all is, I can't see the humor in it, number one. But but before it became dangerous, say four years ago, could you imagine a 25-year-old Bertel laughing about it? Okay, okay. Now I understand, and I agree, because I did this with Flat Earth. I joined the Flat Earth thing on Facebook and I would love to watch those posts and I would make very ironic replies and I thought it was hilarious. I eventually abandoned it because I started realizing how many people really believe it. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, I'm just adding fuel to this weird fire. I'm going to back out. Homer Simpson style. So I do think I understand that now. You're right. If you yeah, didn't you know be, any better. You could be like, oh, what the heck is this? Oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. And then it but gets then, into your head. But wait a minute. Now that's a little funny. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Another person. I'm glad you covered QAnon. I think it is important for therapists to learn about this group. I was raised in a fundamentalist household that taught me these sorts of things are true. Yeah. And it's hard to unlearn. How do you think you might approach this kind of childhood trauma in patience? Well, to answer that question... The broader question is, um, you know, people that come to me who have been indoctrinated into a belief system, what do I do? Well, depends on the goals. I've had people come to me who were, uh, and I won't identify their religion, but it's a very fundamentalist religion in the United States. It's, it's not relatively common, but it's common enough that you probably heard about it. And it was a couple, and they hated each other. <laughs> Oh, but their religion was staunch about you not can't get divorced, can't get divorced, can't right. even separate. Like, right. um, you are bound together by together forever and ever to part. And they, so they came to me and I was like, and tasked me with fixing their marriage. I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Nothing ever worked because one or both of them had had all 10 toes out of the door years ago. Uh-huh. Maybe never even wanted to be in the relationship to begin with. Man. And um, so then it switched to how can we get along? And, and in my head, I'm like, well, you know, there's this thing called divorce <laughs> that will solve all your problems. The D word. Oh no. You just, you don't have to live together. Cause that was the thing. They lived together. Yeah. And that was not an option, but I, but I spent, but so to me from the outside looking in on this cultural pocket, I'm like, you, and this is my culture. You have an unreasonable dogma element that is yeah. preventing you from reaching your full potential as a human being. That is arbitrary, ridiculous, and not shared by most religions in the United States. So there's no need to have that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't need, you could change, but culturally speaking to them, that was impossible. Like that would be uh, essentially, and there were people in their church who had done that and were uh, excommunicated yeah. and, and were, you know, deemed going to hell essentially. Now, are they forced to also live together couldn't they just like stay married but not live together no no they were oh man yeah and so um i you know (laughs) tried to uh introduce flexibility there yeah and maybe even question if their religion was best for them but uh, you know that's i can't obviously that's hard and and so so (laughs) um in the end, I just, well, you know, that's their religion. We, we got to make this work. And, and, you know, I did the best I could within those bounds. Yeah. Uh, so it's case by case. You know, there, there are some people that will come to us having left the cult, if you will, and are asking to be transitioned out. You know, that's a different approach. So, you know, it, it really just depends. Someone could come to me. I could I could have clients who are QAnon. I know I don't now, but, you know, I could have in the past, maybe, or someone similar. And I would know because the topic would never come up. Yeah. Because we're talking about other <laughs> things that they're bringing to me. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, another email here, anonymous listener, longer email here. I'm currently listening to your Q- QAnon episode. 
I'm more conspiracy leaning and right leaning than you are. So I was curious to see what your perspectives and if we would align. My opinion of QAnon is that it seemed like an obvious government psyop meant to bolster Trump's support. What's a psyop, bro? A psychological operation where they are specifically trying to introduce some some element into a population to control them or to influence them in a certain direction. It's like, you know, something the CIA would do. And, do and th- actually stuff they do do, you know, like... Do you th- think QAnon was a PSYOP? Well, in a sense, it definitely was. Uh, you know, th- the question is by whom, you know, but it certainly got started on purpose. Right. I, I, I Okay, actually, let me soften that slightly. It is possible, like... Could have been Bannon trying to bolster Trump support, right? It, it, certainly, but it could also be that it did that elements of it started as a lark, right? The reason I think it was injected pretty on purpose is because what I think happened was they used an existing mechanism, which are these LOL things on 4chan, which are just for the lulls, blah blah. But they used that delivery mechanism, but it was a real agent. AKA Bannon or some someone that was like, hey, let's let's use this community. Or they are part of that community already. What what's hard to tell though is um what the end game was. Right. Because so you could think, well, no, but I mean, the end game was just getting the votes. Yeah, maybe. But at some point it served its purpose and then they moved off. So it's kind of hard to know. I, I think it does. I don't seem- think whoever started it had thought of an end game. Because they probably think, thought this would never take off the way it did. Well, well, if it was someone like a Bannon, they thought they could have easily thought, "Hey, listen, uh, the key here is we need to make sure people don't trust anything. Because if they don't trust anything, they'll only trust us. And so, because we're the ones telling them not to trust anything, so that you know, and so that is possible, but yeah. it's hard to know." Uh, going on. The whole thing had too many movie-like elements. It had the allure of a mystery movie where everyone was trying to crack the code and conquer the bad guys. It was just too good to be true. Meanwhile, Q's cryptic promises never came to pass. I can see how others were swept up in it and probably had a hard time letting go of their beliefs once things started to fall apart. I also support what Berto said about many conspiracies containing seeds of truth which makes them easier to latch on to. For example, the, own, the example, the owner of the Comet Pizza posted incredibly disturbing things on, on his Instagram and seems like a potential pedophile himself. He's just one person in the Q-sphere, but as I'm sure you know, bad people exist. And bad people often find ways to hide their vices and hide behind power. It's a tale as old of, as time, chiming in here, Birdo, did you know that about the Comet Pizza owner? Well, so I don't know that about the owner. Um, I think I had mentioned, but if I didn't, I'll mention now. I I found some of the stuff in the Podesta emails to be a little weird. I, I don't know. I also found some of the art that both him and his brother are into to be very weird. But that's why I was saying, hey, look, man, there's all sorts of ways that you can build a conspiracy out of little grains. And so you could like... You could say, oh, such and such landed at this airport this one day and this other thing happened. And there, yeah. now you're, you know, connecting dots. Yeah. And it's similar to, um, you know, it's anomaly hunting and it's cherry picking. And I can't remember what happened. It was recently where I, you know, someone was feeding me something along those lines. I can't remember what it was, but they were maybe it was on Reddit or something. And, and someone was like, oh, you know, because this happened and then that happened. And then I started as the passive, uh, you know, reader of this stuff, started going, whoa, that is kind of weird. Yeah. And then I, I looked into it more and, and I started to see the signs of, oh, wait. It, actually, it was uh, possibly when we were talking about Ted Bundy in mm. the episode on serial killers, the Dr. Lewis was like, you know, look at the signatures and and look at the entity thing, right. and the way they're presenting it in the documentary. I'm like, well, Whoa. maybe he did have dissociative identity disorder. But then I quickly check in with myself and it's like, well, where's all the other evidence? Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of a stretch, you know, because he he could have 
uh, you know, myself, for example, I might sign, I don't now, but maybe when I was, um, I don't know, just a goofball at the age of 19, I, I might have signed with a nickname here or there. Yeah. Um, I might have referred to, th- you know, this other person. You know, I have a friend who, when he gets really drunk, um, it's this isn't his name, but he says Todd comes out. And it's this jerk face. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, Todd came out last night. Mm-hmm. And um, who knows what Ted Bundy was was referring to, right. what he was. and But I, one, have the ability to go, well, wait, what's the chance here? I'm, yeah. I'm seeing some compelling data, but. What's the other data? But there's an absence of other data that supports this idea yeah. that Ted Bundy had dissociative identity disorder. And then the next thought I have is, well, maybe he did have it, but I don't know. We'll probably never know because he's dead. And, right. And, and I don't know and I don't really care. He probably didn't, given the fact that no one else seemed to see that in him. But I had to make all a lot of um, right. sort of systemic, uh, I don't know how to say this other than to just say like wise evaluations based on like a lot of data all at once in my head. Whereas if I didn't have that cognitive ability or practice or someone taught me that along the way, I would just take those pieces of data and the documentary was clearly trying to make me believe that he had dissociative identity disorder and I would have walked away going, he clearly has it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, unless you have that ability, you are um, helpless against the propaganda that some of these internet players will propagate. Absolutely. And, and the the explosion from a couple of data points is <laughs> egregious. For example, you know, you might say, hey, something weird happened in Roswell in the 1940s or 50s, whatever. Something did crash land, it turns out. Okay. Therefore, and then it's in the de- therefore, right. like we're already questioning the first premise, but even let's say, fine, something weird happened. But the de- therefore goes on to like, the last million years, here's what's been happening. Yeah. Yeah, the pyramids. And the, yeah. Um, going on with the email. I'm generally quite open-minded and also skeptical of power, which is why I don't write off anything until I've had time to learn about it and I allow more evidence to unfold. QAnon just never stood up to scrutiny. So just chiming in here, this idea of being skeptical of power and yet not skeptical, and that's this is not what the emailer is saying, but this idea of like, well, I'm generally skeptical of power. QAnon isn't a power source? Right. QAnon is absolutely a power source, you know? Right. So to, to say like, I question the government, but not Trump, and definitely not QAnon, how, this just doesn't make any sense. Right. It, you would at least want some sort of equal application of scrutiny. <laughs> right. I question the government's claims. Right, right. I question QAnon's claims. Right. I question Trump's claims. Like, but of course, that's not how these people think uh, going on. However, I disagree with many people's knee-jerk impulse to dismiss alternative conspiratorial ideas. Conspiracies don't require as much coordination and cooperation as you might think. Many people just follow orders and blindly do what they're told. 2020 has made that blatantly clear. Chiming in here, what do you think they mean by that? Well, so but we got to distinguish. Um, I, I think it's true that sometimes all it, all it takes for bad things to happen is for some people to get a ball rolling and then other people do their jobs and those jobs are done in the way they would have done them. But because the ball that got rolling is a bad ball, the net result is bad. As an example, let's take the pandemic. So the the people in charge when the pandemic started in this country didn't know what the heck they were doing, you know, at least many of them. And even the people that would have, should have known what to do got swayed and influenced by those people. But I don't believe there was a conspiracy. I don't believe, oh, I see Trump was in on it from the start. <gasps> the Chinese paid Trump a sum of money 10 years ago. No, like, I'm not making this conspiracy. I could. Imagine all the dots I could connect, right? right? But Or I could do it with Hillary, whoever, right? You pick your... T- but I don't need to because I'm... The thing I always advocate, and I know you do too, is people are fallible. They are liars. Especially they when... They keep secrets. Th- especially they, when you add everyone up. It's almost uh, exactly. like if you have a thousand people in a group 
that, you know, like the government, for example, you add up all of their f- f- uh, shortcomings <laughs> yeah. and you have a mountain of incompetence. You know, yeah. it, it's additive, right? Yeah. You know, it's not like you take all of their competence and all of their incompetence. You know, it's like all their incompetence adds up to a chaotic mess of of general incompetence. And look, we we actually have peaks inside of the machinery, like t- take the Iran Contra or even more recent scandals and stuff. Are there conspiracies that happen within the government? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. As in, this general had a conversation with this senator, they had some agreement to do this one thing, they deployed the troops here, bad things happen, or unethical, whatever you want to call them, and then no one knew about it on this side of the aisle, and then news gets out. Sure, that was a conspiracy. But, but then there's levels of these things. First of all, that thing came out. Okay, some don't come out. But when we're saying, oh, okay, worldwide cabals for hundreds of years and, and everyone is in line. Drinking blood to you know, extend their actors, lives. Actors and then, and then you're denying it, so you're in on it. And the, yeah. That's where it's like, well. Oprah Winfrey. That, that's a different universe. Tom Hanks, the Pope. But Berto, what do you mean? So they're like, many people just follow orders and blindly do what they're told, 2020 has made that blatantly clear. What do, what do you think they mean by 2020? I think they're saying like people just wear their masks because they were told. People just get their injections because they were told. Yeah, that's what it sounded like um, going on. I think it's because it's human nature to want to trust authority and assume people are working in good faith. Most people are good, but a small minority of power-hungry people are not. These people prey on our good-natured assumptions and get away with a lot before they're caught. As a personal anecdote, my best friend's boyfriend of five years was maintaining four different long-term relationships at one time. He had everyone fooled. He was also pursuing a career in politics. Just shows you what type of people are transfixed by the idea of gaining power. Yeah, I mean, a dude that is psychopathically lying to four different partners. (laughs) That's an anomaly right there. Uh, Anyway, so... Just to um, remind everyone w- how many people believe this sort of stuff, <laughs> Berto, I just, I just, I'm just amazed at these uh, percentage yeah. points. Um, how many people agree percentage-wise with the following statement? The levers of power are controlled by a cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles, percentage of Americans yeah. who believe that statement. Wasn't it like 13%? 17%. 17%. Twenty-three percent are Republicans, seven yeah. percent are Democrats. Yeah. The levers of power are yeah. controlled by a cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles. Yeah. So, I would understand if they're like, "There's a group of pedophiles who are working behind the scenes, and it's much bigger than you realize." I'd be like, "Okay, probably not true. There are groups of pedophiles that are they are out yeah. there." So it's not that much to, th- to kind of think, well, you know, it's a lot more prevalent. You don't realize you're a sheeple. You know, it's way bigger than you think. Okay. Not only that, but they're Satan worshiping, which is like, how, why does that have to be in there? Pedophiles don't need Satan to be a pedophile, you know? Right. And to be clear, by pedophiles, we're talking about criminal pedophiles. Right. There, there are pedophiles that don't actually act on their, on their desire. Right. Um, so they're Satan worshiping. But by the way, the, the pedophile part is burying the lead. They are homicidal maniacs, right? Murdering and torturing and and dismembering, and sucking blood. Like right. these are cannibalistic homicidal maniacs. Right. The pedophile part is one of those bullet points down below. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so not only Satan worshiping pedophiles, but the levers of power are controlled by the by a cabal. Actually, seventeen percent, Berto, of Americans believe that statement to be true. But this is this is also very telling, dude. The obsession with the demonization of sexuality makes it so that the first headline is they're pedophiles. Right. Never mind that they've been murdering yeah. and torturing and 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 Sucking the blood. Yeah. The important part is that they're pedophiles. Yeah. Also, here's the here's an example. So you have real life situations where powerful some powerful individuals in Hollywood had been praying for as long as Hollywood has existed on their power on uh, praying on innocent people because of their power okay 
All right, so that's a reality. And we have learned recently about many of these people. Okay, so from there to Hollywood is run by alien civilizations that prey on the suffering of actors. And they have these, like, and then you make up this thing. Cows, casting couches are actually alien vehicles that transport them to a different dimension. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Because no one has to believe in a conspiracy to, to agree that, oh, I see, when you put a little insulated group of powerful people that have unbounded power in that community, a percentage of them are going to abuse that power. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's humans. Right. And and we've seen that with, potentially, we don't know, with Prince Andrew yeah. and with, yeah. who was friends with, um, what's his face? Who, who The Epstein, yeah. Epstein. Yeah. Who is, and you know, we have, you see R. Kelly. But, you know. but again, so um, for the length of human history, we have all the stories about King Louis such and such and his orgies and the things and the Roman emperors and their Caligula and stuff. Yeah. This isn't new, right? So you're like, okay, powerful people where, who are given unlimited funds of money and unlimited power. And basically, and lack are, of and scrutiny. Are, well, and are interested in harming others. Well, well I, I'm actually backing up for a second. I'm saying, what are they going to do? Well, many of them will do things that might be unethical. Not yeah. necessarily have harems of kids. I, insider saying, trading. All sorts of things, right? Now, many of them will associate with other powerful people. And many of them will be invited to events, functions, parties, things with those people. Yeah, nepotism. And out of those, some percentage will start engaging in the same kind of really bad things as the other people. Doesn't need a... What you don't have to add to that is 10,000 years ago, a serpent bit a thing and then... Well, like, you know, like but you don't or, have or, to even, or even the next level that they do, which is that they're all in on it, all the Democrats... By the way, it's 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 never Walker Texas Ranger. It's never no, no. Ronald Reagan. It, it is it's and always it's all of them, and they are the demons. Democrats. And they yeah. are demons, and they're conducting satanic rituals. Yeah, and they're believing that they're d doing adrenochrome to live for. A, this yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Like next statement, Berto. Republicans percentage believe Donald Trump has been secretly fighting a group of child sex traffickers that include prominent Democrats and Hollywood elites. Percentage of Republicans that believe that statement is true. Uh, it was 25%. 29, close. The elites would soon be swept from power by the coming storm. Total percentage of Americans, Berto. Total Americans, 12%. 20%. 20%? Because things have gotten so off, far off track, what? true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Oh, jeez. Republicans. Oh, 25. 28. Eight percent of Democrats. Um, let's see. Surveillance chip is placed in the COVID nineteen vaccines. <laughs> Total Americans. Um, seven uh, percent. Close nine. So I just want to remind everyone about that. Let's take a break and we get back. Let's purge all this stuff and answer some emails. What do you say, Bert? Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. I have had these emails sitting in this file for months, Berto, so God knows if these emails even <laughs> apply anymore. But patron Anna from Adelaide, South Australia says, agree or disagree, um, we really need environmental optimism. Can I offer some constructive criticism on your climate crisis pessimism, Kirk? <laughs> I'm 27 and would describe myself as having eco-anxiety. At the end of your episode, you became very dark and pessimistic about climate change. Your arguments felt very compelling and incredibly scary to me. I felt myself beginning to spiral into another existential crisis. I can't imagine I'm alone. So I reached for the chapter of The Environmental Optimist by David Boyd. As Boyd acknowledges, climate change is a huge threat facing us all, but there are good things happening. We have already solved many environmental challenges and we do have a reason to be optimistic. Do you agree optimism is what we need to keep us going? It keeps us from fear, the fear that suppresses our concern for others and causes us to focus on our own interests. As a millennial, the climate crisis terrifies me, but the only thing I know to do is to keep using my little spoon to turn this boat around. But I get overwhelmed and I need a break. Uh, when I get overwhelmed and I need a break, I, I'm gonna sip a mojito by that pool and hug some loved ones. Then when I'm better, I'm gonna get that little spoon out again Berto, what do you think? There's two types of optimism in this world. 
One type of optimism is, don't worry, we'll figure it out. And by we, we mean someone, not me. There's another type of optimism, which is, it's serious, it's real, but I'm going to keep trying because that's all we can do. And so that's the, that's the kind I am, right? I am like, I don't care how dire it is. We live in a binary decision universe and I can either choose to do something or not. So I'm going to try to do something. Now, what, what I think is the risk of the optimism is if, you say, if, if optimism means that first kind and we say, yeah, it's bad, but humans have always, humans have always existed and we'll, we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. And then you do nothing because who's going to figure it out? Like who's figuring what out? It's going to take a lot of miracles all lining up for us to steer a ship in a different direction. It's just that I choose to be on the side of like, yeah, let's try that. It's hard. But let's let's do everything we can to do that. So it, it's kind of like an optimism of uh, we are down, uh, to use a football analogy, we are down 100 points in the in the second quarter or something. <laughs> I don't know what football is. But, uh, you know, we're at the halftime and the coach says, uh, we could go home right now because we're probably going to lose. Or the coach says, we are not going down without a fight. We're going to do this and we're going to pull everything. And here's our strategy. Okay. And so that's optimism. I'm, that's the kind of optimism I like. I don't like the optimism that says, don't worry, it'll be fine. We'll win the game. Yeah, I mean, the analogy is breaks a little bit down. I don't know football. Well, that and it's not a win or lose situation. It's just a matter of what's going to happen. Sure. And yeah, I get it, uh, Anna. Um, and I'm sorry that I caused anxiety. Um, but, well, and um, what do I say? The science, particularly more recently, you know, there's a major report put out that was um, giving us information that was a, was at the worst end of our predictions. You know, we're 10 years ago when we were looking at 2021, we were like, well, here's the error bars. Right. And it's it's at the worst end. You know, the the average Celsius increase globally is worse than what the average what we thought even and the average was bad right the average is like crap if the if the average happens in terms of global warming average wise across the world then oh boy right and if the average happens in terms of our inability to cut back on greenhouse gases then oh boy it turns out we're worse than right. than we thought we were going to be we're worse off than our bad predictions so it's it's dire and one I, I don't it's not a matter of pessimism or optimism those are facts those aren't I, i'm not i'm no. not being a bummer i'm pointing out facts that um species are becoming extinct by the second uh oceans are going to rise even if we turn off all of our machines which of course is never going to happen the uh temperature is going to continue to rise um, there are potential extremely dire possibilities that aren't likely in the near future but could happen it's not like life is inevitable on this planet <laughs> i right. mean it's not like humans are inevitable or society isn't inevitable it is something that's held together by a very uh you know thin web of dependencies that humans have on the climate that the climate has on this and animals have on that and jet stream has on this and the um the uh the ocean currents and bacteria and right. plants and predators you know everything is interwoven and so now pessimism is um an interesting dimension to think about optimism versus pessimism um, yeah, I mean, pessimistic is not what I would call myself. What I would call myself is fucking angry and disappointed and frustrated. Now, if that's, 
interpreted as pessimism. I don't know what to say about that. Do, do I have faith in humans? No, I don't. There's no evidence to point to any humans having any ability as a group, as a planet, particularly international, right? You know, say the U. just on the weirdest chance, because, you know, Biden put forth his um, plan, which might be one of the best we could possibly get from a president, you yeah. know, and it's it falls way short. You know, Greta Thunberg was like, that's a joke. Yeah, because it is a joke. Because it's not, you know, it's way far from the mark. We have to be doing way more aggressive But, but crap. we know that n- nothing is going to be done significantly until it's an emergency, right? Aren't we at that point? No, we're, we're not. Because no one uh, in power is directly in that emergency. So, so, if it's pessimistic, if that's the label that you're applying to me, pessimism versus optimism has to do with predictions of the future. I predict that I'll be happy tomorrow. Ah, okay, so I think that's where we disagree, but maybe we just need different words. Because think about World War II. Imagine we're in a, a concentration camp, or if not that dire, we are in a foxhole somewhere, and we're losing, right? It's not just about, I think we're going to win. Don't worry, cheer up. We'll figure it out. That, to me, is the type A optimism, right? The type B, and maybe it's the optimism is the wrong word, just like you were saying, maybe pessimism. It doesn't matter. We're going to fight. Well, and then the another uh, type of pessimism is it. we're doomed, why try? And at no time have right. I ever said that. I've said the opposite. <laughs> well, you did, actually, you did actually imply that it was pointless. It's pointless to do anything about the damage that's already done. Uh-huh. But we absolutely can turn this around we are now facing it if we don't which is a possibility and and i guess i'm pessimistic about that that in 500 years we'll be back in the hunter gatherer times well, I, so okay so what's funny is these words are very interesting i can't tell, i can't tell if i'm more pessimistic than you or not because i am i am like 99.9 percent convinced things are gonna get disastrous worldwide for sure how soon uh, now <laughs> like it's just that like what? give me an example give the listeners an example fires will get worse people will be displaced uh places that are currently habitable will become inhabitable uh water is going to be not available for millions maybe a billion people and they'll die because of it oh absolutely yeah, yeah. and uh mass migrations war famine the works not to mention not even the opportunity because the air will choke out a whole bunch of people including potentially us so how come i'm the pessimist (laughs) because this is what i'm saying like i think the words are maybe pointless because i'm saying yeah like i agree with the science report i think the time to do something was a hundred years ago uh let's put it this way there was a time to reassess a lot of things about human society that we wouldn't have possessed the capability of reassessing. And that time has passed a long time ago. However, now what? And that's why I'm saying I'm the type B optimist, which is, uh, yes, I realize we're down a thousand points at the half. We're still going to fight. And that's the only thing that we can do. (laughs) So if we do everything we can, realistically, given your prediction of the future, what difference can we make? Uh, one of two things, um, aliens a billion years from now will find some record of this civilization that really fought to the la- their dying breath, and they'll honor us. And <laughs> they'll, they, they will, they'll, they'll put a statue it, up. It, they'll make a movie called 500, about the 500 brave humans that tried to stop that. Um, <laughs> but the second case is like, look, we have surprised ourselves, right? So there are, like I just heard last week um, that Ford... Their new electric truck is like the number one selling vehicle now. So much so that they're ramping up whole new waves of hiring and opening up whole new Yeah, factories. you realize, and I'm sure you know this, that that change is 
like a spoon in the ocean. It, it sort of is, right? But at the same time, like that's Ford, an American company that sure. makes trucks. Yeah. Who buys trucks, by the way? Do you buy? Do you have one? Do you want to pick up? So I'm on board with you oh, totally. Um, we are making advances, as Boyd wrote in the book. There are advance. We're we're driving down prices of solar. We're installing around the world uh, nuclear and wind, right, and other you know uh, types of um, renewable energy, uh, hydro, and there are countries you know in Europe that uh, have you know there's this, I, I was watching this documentary about these islands um, in the north of Scotland that have so much wind power that they have to bleed it off to the mainland Scotland. And uh-huh. so their entire island is completely power wow. free on, on wind. So, you know, there's a future that that could be. Could be. But when you look at the, and those those examples are inspiring and it gives us hope and we're doing things and people, you know, governments are working together and scientists are building things. And I saw a report where they developed this ocean powered, you know, cause the waves of the ocean, you can, you can harness that energy mm-hmm. to power a desalinization plant that can, cause we have a lot of water. Yeah, yeah. We just have a lot of salt water that you can't drink right. and it creates, you need power to desalinate the water to drink it. And so the problem with water, as you were saying before, is you know with with changes of temperatures, you're gonna, rivers are going to dry up and lakes are going to dry up. There's going to be whole swaths of people without any. We need to start looking towards how to harness the ocean, you know. And there's a way to not only harness the water, but also to harness the power of yeah. the waves of the ocean. And you know, it's possible that in 30 years there will be plants of, that will be all around and will save millions of people that wouldn't get water otherwise. My point is, is that things are happening. But when you look at the science, things have been happening, by the way. I'm old, so one of the things that I can point to as a 50-year-old person is there has been talk and talk and talk and talk. I have been thinking about environmentalism since the mid-70s. I remember, you know, since I, I grew up of that generation where we were taught in the 70s and 80s that we needed to do something. Yeah. And there have been talk and politicians and voting and talk and politicians and news stories and scientists. And what has been the result, Berto? Right. We have gone farther and farther down the pit of despair. But it's the same thing with the pandemic. In February and March, there was enough information to know what needed to be done. And it wasn't done. No one wanted to do anything. And so then things got really bad. And then they got even way worse, right? Because we still didn't want to do. So I, I think that it takes, it is going to, sadly, it's going to take so, so a lot but, of but death. To, but to finish my point, on that analogy, does that mean I don't get the vaccine? No. Does that mean I don't uh, promote getting the vaccine? No. Part of my strategy about sounding pessimistic or sounding scared is I want to motivate all of you to do something that you can do. Vote. Become a scientist in this area, conserve, buy an electric truck. I have a platform. And when we look at George Washington, he was worshipped at the time. But when we look at him now, slave owner. When we look at President Lincoln, he was a god at the time, you know, for some people. Some people hated A lot of people hated him. But, you know, soon after his death, people really liked him. We look back now, kind of a racist. <laughs> you know, like yeah. there, there are criticisms. A hundred years from now, what are they going to look at people of my generation? I guarantee you they're going to see us as the generation of idiots that destroyed the planet. Well, that would be unfair. <laughs> at the very least, I want to say to that, those people 100 years from now, <laughs> you know, I tried. You know, so the other thing is, is, is I have a platform and I can affect people. And although you, Anna, are on board and you've got the spoon out in the ocean and you're trying to move that, you're trying to turn that boat around but a lot of listeners right now are not. And so I'm gonna use my platform to to bring reality, um, not that I have the reality, but the scientists have given me the reality and I'm passing it along so that you, the listener, can do so. I will not, I have a platform, I'm gonna use it. Right, but what if it's the Winston Churchill slash Lincoln style, which is 
They knew. I mean, you don't think Winston Churchill knew that it was probably the end of the British Empire? They knew. But they didn't go on the air and say that, right? They went on the air and they said, we will fight. We will fight them in the shores. We will fight them in the blah, blah, blahs. We will persevere. But he was probably like, no, we probably won't. (laughs) So I think it's a difference between, as humans, we have to make a decision. Because we're, we're guaranteed nothing in this universe. I'm saying that you're slightly wrong in your tone because if people are perceiving it as pessimistic, then you're not tweaking the tone to be. So here's the difference. Here's the difference, people. Either things are going to be crappy or really crappy. You make the choice. That's what I'm saying. And I and I'm thinking right. And of course, you're free to say it as you want to say it. That's what the science is saying. But it doesn't matter. It. it what matters is. I'm going to lie to people. Yeah. We can do it. Yeah. We can no, no, win. no, no. See, that's that's type A. We can win. No, that's type A. That's not what we want. We want type B. We will fight them in the shores. We will fight them to all. That's dying what I just breath. said. I just said, you, the listener, I have a platform. You're yeah, going to do something. Skip the first part. Skip the first part. Don't skip say, the reason. Don't say we're doomed. So I'm just supposed to come on the air and be like, by the way, everything's going to be fine, but do everything no. you can. No, skip, no, skip the, both versions of the first part. You don't say everything's going to be fine. I'm just supposed to say, for, for no reason in particular, we have to do something. Well, I'm, I'm going to say... No, you can I'm, paint the picture For a no bit. reason at all, I'm, I'm begging you, the listener, to do something. You can paint the picture a bit. But you don't say, we have just lost half of England. Most of us are going to die. Like, you don't say that. You, you do paint the picture, though, of the dire enemy. But you were the one who painted the, the well, dire because picture. because we were having this conversation. I haven't said anything horrible. I, I hadn't said that before this, you know, like... I'm, I was I was explaining that I'm coming at it from like no I agree with the science and all these things, but then what 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 is our take? I'm a human being and I am looking at the data and this is how it's going through my emotional center. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm expressing those emotions. I don't think well I'm not saying you're wrong for that. I'm having a actual rational I believe a, a dire disappointed, slightly depressed emotional reaction to the data. The question is. Are you trying to influence behavior? That's the only thing. And if if for this topic, you don't have the energy or you can't, that's fine. That's totally fine. If you're trying to influence behavior, the next question you is- You said earlier, the, o- the only time the politicians are gonna do something is when it affects them. The only time, a pol- uh, ye, probably, yeah. But if we're going to get change before people are affected, we have to scare the crap out of them. No. 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 I'm scared, I'm motivated. The, I think that you don't have to do that. That happens already. That this listener just told you they're already scared. Then they don't need to listen to me. Well, they're already on the right side of history. And I completely think it's rational to stare into the darkness at night and be scared about what's going to happen in the future. That's my analogy. You, you, you know that the people hearing the bombing were already scared. Their children are with them. They're huddled. The buildings are being collapsed. They're already scared. They don't need to listen in on the radio to someone scaring them further. I'm not Winston Churchill. I'm scared in the bunker. Yeah. <laughs> I know. If I were Winston Churchill, if I was Biden, I would not speak the way I am. Yeah. I would speak the way Churchill did during the, during the war. I would say, we're going to do this. Here's the plan. This is what's going to happen. I would have the power to lay out the infrastructure and the plans and bring people together. I don't have that power. I'm well, sitting here, I'm being right. bombed, completely powerless like everyone else. But you have the shortwave radio that you can say like, here, I know we can't, we don't, I don't own the planes, we're not the military, but here's the thing we as a community can do. You run this way, you do that. At night, you don't stay in this part. And it's not always this way, you know? I don't mope every minute of every day, but when I think about it, it's, powerless it's i don't trust our governments and because even if the united states government managed to get the crap together which i doubt would ever happen in the near future in my lifetime honestly we have to depend on all the governments of the world to work together yep which is like when has that ever happened we are still kind of in a cold war with china (laughs) you know we're not allies with china yeah we can't we can't agree on simple things like if taiwan exists you know and so well but the pandemic did help us a bit right like it 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 made the world 
realize like, hey, uh, this affects all of us. What needs to happen is possible humanly, but there's no trend in that direction. Well, it might not even be possible humanly. We don't know. No, right. it's po it's possible. Well, it's possible for all the humans on the planet, the governments, to say, we are going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to tell our people everyone's going to have to pay a price. Yeah, but we don't know. Like, in reality, no matter which plan you put into motion, we're talking about 7 billion people with their own opinions and ideas, and l look at what it happens I know, when you I, tell I know, people to wear I know, but I'm just masks. saying, like, it, it's, it's impossible... <laughs> It's not like physically impossible, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it, if we just decided as a collective to do this, it could happen. It's not going to. And that's the thing. As a collective, I don't think we can. But as individuals, we can. You've already made a choice, which is, yeah, you're going to do what you can. You just feel terrible about it, which is totally understandable. I'm in kind of the same boat, which is I'm like, hell, I got to do what I can. And then I guess if I were putting a message out, it's like, yeah, let's all of us do what we can. But the, the analogy that Anna says, I'm in the big boat, huge like tanker, and I've got my spoon and I'm trying to turn this thing around. I'm right there with you, Anna. I've got my spoon yeah. and, I'm, and I'm trying to wave people over with my podcast. Get your spoons in the water. But I look up and there's this gigantic engine being driven by our governments that we will never be able to turn this boat around until they turn us around. But it's okay, because art's bigger than that. You will be written about by the aliens, and you had a spoon in the water. Yeah. And that's bigger, and, and I really do mean that. Like, think about the things we care about. Most of those things are long dead. Like, even the Beatles, half of them are gone, but we care about it. The Egyptians are gone, and pyramids, all of it, but we care about it. So, in some ways, the poem is the more important part. Did you go out with a spoon in the water or did you not? You know, I think it, it, there's some similarities to the Bo, Bo, Bur, Burnham, Burnham, Burnham. Burnham. You know how I reacted to his making fun of suicide? Uh -huh. And do you know how people reacted to me reacting that well, what'd way? What did they say? Well, they were like... They were against my reaction, let's say. Okay. I don't remember the specific, but they were very against my reaction. And I was against his reaction. In the, actually, in, in the comment section of YouTube? Yeah, yeah. I was against his, his approach to it, and they were against my reaction to his approach. But to your point, it's like, well, his approach to it is how he deals with it. My reaction to his approach is my reaction to his approach. And their reaction to my reaction is their reaction. So we're all entitled to our approaches and reactions. The only thing that I was saying was, it does matter what, what you're hoping to accomplish and whether you're accomplishing it or not. And that's really up to you to evaluate and decide. You know, that's, um, but it's sort of independent or, or maybe it's, it's orthogonal to how you're reacting and feeling. Like, you, to your point, yeah, I no just one don't... should be able to tell you how to feel. <laughs> and so to get really, really dark... That's what I briefly mentioned the, the concentration camp. I, I don't want to spend much time there because I, I really am in no position to talk about it, except you could have imagined similar situations where some people were acknowledging the, the brutal reality of the situation and were basically done. And other people were just trying to keep living and being positive or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, yeah. famous, you know, Man's Search for Meaning, was in, a, uh, it was in Auschwitz and saw... So you know, everyone in his family die, his wife, his yeah. parents, so many people around him. And he saw that for some, when they gave up, they uh, physically would would die. Yeah. You know, they, they it, the demoralization led to perhaps physiological changes that essentially they didn't have a will to live anymore. But they, they must have been asking him or others, how the heck are you not demoral? Like... And, but he, but he, he, he had a belief that he was going to live. He had mm. a belief that he was going to get out and he was going to be able to write about his experiences. That's an irrational belief. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, and what he believes is that that belief kept him alive. What yeah. I would say is there were thousands of other people who also believed they were going to get out and got and shot and killed yeah. or went to the gas chamber. So it's not, you just happen to live. Yeah. But the lesson is still fine, I think, which is essentially his idea was, it translates to all of us, which is life is suffering. Yeah. 
And we, there are a lot of things out of our control and we can just give up and just be a leaf in the wind and be miserable. Or we can say, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. And hundred percent. You know, I'm not giving up. Yep. I'm, 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 I'm doing more because of my demoralization. I'm like, well, you know, got to start somewhere. It's a huge ocean, one spoon of water, one at a time. And I, you know, that's that's what I'm doing anyway. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Keep your spoons in the water because you deserve it.